them in a manner that is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For Allah will not accept simply because we do something good. He will accept only that which He is pleased with. And you and I have to do certain things to hopefully ensure that Allah the Exalted is pleased with what we're doing. So we pray that Allah will not only make it easy, but that He would help us to fast in a way or in a manner that is pleasing to Him. And that He would accept our fasting and our prayers and our du'as and all our good deeds. And that He would also inspire us to train ourselves to do good things in this blessed month. <coughs> while at the same time being able to unlearn some of the bad habits that we might have. What I would like to do today, brothers and sisters, is to talk about a, couple, uh, a number of questions that people ask regarding fasting in terms of do's and don'ts. Actually, earlier today, I had a class at the Islamic Institute, and I used the period since uh, tomorrow is the last day of school anyways, to allow the students, and these are students in grade six, to ask questions that they have concerning fasting and, and Ramadan. <coughs> And interestingly, many of these questions are also questions that even grown-ups have. Uh, one of the questions that came up is about niyyah. When do you make the niyyah of fasting? Now, intention is absolutely necessary for every act and every deed we perform. Without which Allah the Exalted will not accept it. So if someone just does something out of habit, without really being aware of what he or she is doing and why he or she is doing it, then such a deed is not accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we must pay attention to why we're doing something, the motivation behind doing it. That is basically the intention. And thus, as you can see from this, brothers and sisters, niyyah, its place is in the heart. As the Imam al nawawi mentions, in his uh, explanation of Sahih Muslim, he said, The place of the intention is in the heart. What this means is there is no formula per se to recite for the niyyah. In fact, brothers and sisters, the only niyyah the Sahaba ever heard the Prophet ﷺ reciting aloud in words is the niyyah for Hajj and Umrah. They heard him say, Labbaik Allahumma Hajjah. <clears throat> Besides the Hajj or Umrah, they did never heard the Prophet uh, putting his niyyah into words. So what is required is the awareness, is the awareness in the heart. Brother Abdul Wahid, maybe you need to turn down the volume on the speakers. What is important is the awareness that a person has that he or she is going to do this or about to do this. That's what the niyyah is. And in the case of fasting in Ramadan, this awareness has to be there from the night before. The Prophet ﷺ said there is no fasting for the person who does not make the niyyah from the night before. But what that means <coughs> is that when you go to sleep, or pr just prior to sleeping, when you set your alarm clock to wake up, I don't know, 3.15 maybe or 3 o'clock, knowing that you want enough time to eat your suhoor before fasting, that is your niyyah right there. That awareness you have. So there's nothing that you need to recite per se as the niyyah. It's that awareness that you have when you, when you do these things in terms of setting your alarm, or in terms of checking that the alarm is set to the proper time and correct time. And it is set to AM rather than PM, alright? If you set it for PM, you know what will happen. See, this is your awareness. And this is what the niya is. So in terms of niya, it should happen the night before. One should be aware that he or she is, is going to uh, wake up the next morning uh, uh, in order to eat suhoor for fasting. That's your niya. Also, people have asked, can you make one niyyah for the whole month of Ramadan? 
Now, although we are required to fast an entire month, we still have to make a niyyah for every day of fasting. Because each day is an independent period of time from the next day. If we were fasting continuously 24-7 for the month, and that of course will probably kill us, uh, maybe we could do that. But since each day is a time period by itself, it has a beginning and an ending, we are required to renew that niya every night before the next day of fasting. The third question that comes up a lot as well is whether or not a person is allowed to brush his or her teeth while fasting. Many people think that using toothpaste is not allowed because it has some kind of a taste. Well, brothers and sisters, the Prophet ﷺ made it clear, and Allah the Exalted made it clear in the Quran that it's eating and drinking, that is swallowing. Anything goes down the throat, this is what breaks the fast. And unless you're using toothpaste with the intention of eating it, then it does not break your fast. It helps to keep your mouth clean, which is highly recommended. The Prophet ﷺ said in one hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, As-siwaku madharatun lil-fam, mardatun lil-rab. As-siwaku madharatun lil-fam. Brushing the teeth cleans the mouth. Wa mardatun lil-rab, and it is pleasing to the Lord. And in the other hadith, also in Sahih al-Bukhari, to highlight the importance of brushing teeth and keeping your mouth clean, the Prophet ﷺ said, and you all know this hadith, had it not been for the fact that it would have been difficult on my followers, I would have ordered them to brush their teeth before every prayer. Five times a day. It would have been compulsory. But that would have been too hard for us, and so the Prophet ﷺ did not enforce it. However, we understand from his statement the importance of having a clean mouth and brushing the teeth, of course, is perhaps the primary method by which we do that. In any case, Al-Imam al-Bukhari has told us in his Sahih that the Sahaba used to use the green miswa while fasting in Ramadan to brush their teeth. And this is quite significant because the green miswa obviously would have the juices of the plant in, the, in that branch. And so when you brush your teeth with it, the juices will inevitably get into your mouth. But they saw no problems with that because you're not going to swallow that or eat it. It is simply a matter of cleaning your, your teeth and brushing your teeth. And so as long as you take care not to eat it or to swallow it, then it is allowed to do so. Some people argue that the Prophet ﷺ said, by Allah, the smell of that comes out of the mouth of a fasting person is sweeter in the sight of Allah than musk, than perfume. And they say, they use this hadith as evidence and proof that it is better not to brush your teeth while fasting. But that is not true. Because I'm sure, brothers and sisters, the Prophet ﷺ, when he said the smell coming out of the mouth of a fasting person is sweeter than musk in the sight of Allah. He did not mean the person who doesn't brush his teeth and have all kinds of food remnants in his mouth and on the tongue and that that causes bad breath and that that is sweeter in the sight of Allah. I'm sure he didn't mean that. So in as much as we may brush our teeth regularly while fasting, the reality still is that because we are not eating and drinking for an extended period of time, the odor in the mouth will change. This is natural and normal. It is that that the Prophet ﷺ talks about, not about the person who is lazy and who has no or a very low consciousness of personal hygiene and then claims that this smell is sweeter in the sight of Allah. No. Brothers and sisters, the Prophet ﷺ was very, very particular and serious about personal hygiene in general and offending people with any odor emanating from his body in particular to the point where he said alayhi salam he prohibited the one who, who, who ate garlic or onion raw from coming to the masjid for salat al-jama'ah 
Now we all know the importance of Salat al-Jama'ah. Yet the Prophet ﷺ recommended that the person who ate onion and garlic raw, and there's nothing wrong with eating them raw, by the way, that is permissible. But he did not want that person to come to the masjid and now offend the people around him or her with the smell of the onion or garlic. That is how particular he was about offending others beside you in public places. And so we need to take care, even while fasting, that, you know, see, brothers and sisters, fasting and these ahadith should not be used as an excuse for laziness and for uh, untidiness and for dirtiness. No. It shouldn't be used as excuses for this. We do the best we can in terms of keeping our mouths clean and then eventually, of course, there is a change of odor and that is what the Prophet ﷺ referred to while fasting. People also ask a lot, um, you know, can we put oil in our hair? Can we use eye drops? Can we use hair drops? All these things are permissible in terms of using oil or cream, hair drops, eye drops, because you're not swallowing, swallowing them or eating them. Even getting shots. If you have to travel and you need tetanus shot or a meningitis shot, it does not break the fast because these shots do not provide nourishment for the body. If you have to get an IV though, that's different. If you, by external means, nourish the body, then that will break your fast because the whole purpose of prohibiting eating and drinking is to limit nourishment to the body for certain reasons, of course, which we have talked about. So, uh, using uh, uh, drops or, or, or shots that may be nourishment to the body, that will break the fast. But it's for other reasons, it does not break your fast. So, alhamdulillah, if you have allergies and your eyes become itchy and red, you can certainly use Visine or other eye drops to, to help you to ease the, the, the uh, discomfort you feel. And likewise, air drops and things like that. Uh, people also ask, what happens if you break a fast while fasting in Ramadan? Well, there's a couple of scenarios we need to look at. First of all, the breaking of the fast can be deliberate or it can be out of forgetfulness. So let's deal with the deliberate breaking of the fast in Ramadan. The deliberate breaking of the fast in Ramadan has two scenarios as well. One is that a person knows and deliberately breaks the fast with a valid excuse. And the other, of course, is the one where the person has no valid reason or excuse for doing so. Now, breaking of the fast intentionally, knowingly, that you're doing this with a valid excuse is permissible if you reach that stage where you're not able to continue fasting, then you are allowed to break your fast with no sin incurred Although the person will have to make up after Ramadan for the number of days missed or this one day that is broken in Ramadan must be made up for uh, with another day after Ramadan sometime. But there is no sin. If the breaking is done with a justifiable reason such as becoming ill or such as reaching a point where you become extremely hungry and you cannot bear because the whole objective of fasting, brothers and sisters, as we have uh, talked about before, is not to put our health at risk or our lives in danger. Allah says in verse 185 in Surah Al-Baqarah, in, in context of fasting, يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ بِكُمُ الْيُسْرُ وَلَا يُرِيدُ بِكُمُ الْعُسْرُ Allah wants ease for you, He does not want hardships, unnecessary hardships. Now if a person deliberately breaks the fast without a, uh, a good excuse, then breaking the fast without a valid excuse, deliberately of course, is a sin. And that individual must do tawbah and istighfar to wipe out that sin of breaking the fast without a valid excuse. Plus, that person still has to fast one day after Ramadan to make up for this one day that is broken in Ramadan. It's one for one. Now I know there are a hadith and so on to talk about the, the, the highlight, the serious nature of deliberately breaking fasts without valid excuses. But in terms of the fiqh ruling, 
of making up for the one day that is broken, it's one for one. It is one for one. But there is a sin, of course, in breaking deliberately without an excuse. So that is an independent issue for which the person needs to do tawbah and istighfar. And Allah the Exalted is forgiving if once we're sincere. The other scenario is where a person unintentionally breaks the fast. So he or she may forget and eat and drink. Forgetful eating and drinking does not break your fast, period. And this is based on a hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari in which the Prophet said, مَن نَسِيَ فَأَكَلَ وَشَرِبَ فَلْيُطِمَّ سَوْمَهُ Whoever forgets that eat and drinks, that is while fasting, let him complete his fast. Complete it, it's perfect. فَإِنَّمَا أَطْعَمَهُ اللَّهُ وَسَقَى For surely it is Allah who gave him to eat and drink. Now, a couple of points to note here. If you're in the middle of eating and drinking, you have, and you remember, you have to stop immediately. You can't say, well, let me finish this plate of food and I'll stop. Because part of that is deliberately still eating and drinking while you know you're fasting. Right. Hopefully you won't throw out the food, you'll put it in the fridge maybe and eat it at iftar time. So if you remember during the process of eating and drinking, you stop immediately. If, however, you remember after the fact, then there is nothing you have to do. You don't have to throw up. Right, in twos vomiting in order to get rid of that food. No. If, if it's after the fact, then it does not uh, affect the validity of the fast. You continue to fast. As the Prophet ﷺ said, it is Allah who gave the person to eat and drink. Now, on the issue of vomiting, again, many people uh, are of the view that it breaks the fast, so they're not sure. Again, Imam al-Bukhari has discussed this issue in his Sahih and he is of the opinion and the view that throwing up or vomiting does not break your fast. Because, as he mentions from Abu Huraira it is what goes down the throat that breaks the fast, not what comes up. Now, of course, when you, a person throws up, they would need to gargle and rinse their mouth. And there may be a little bit of taste after that, sour taste if you like. Uh, that is okay because you have no control over that. Perhaps what some scholars are afraid of is that when you throw up, some food particles may remain in the throat and go back down. The thing is, brothers and sisters, that you and I, you and I have no control over. If it comes out of the throat, we have control. We can either spit it out or swallow it back. No one wants to swallow it back, of course. But even if some food particles were to remain below that part of the throat where we have no control, then Allah the Exalted does not and will not hold us accountable for things that are beyond our control, for things we have no control over. So if a person were to throw up during, uh, while fasting during Ramadan, then that person should simply rinse his or her mouth and gargle and so on and continue fasting. If the throwing up is, is a result of an illness, then that person may need to break the fast, depending on the situation. An illness is, of course, a valid ex excuse. Because Allah tells us in the Quran, وَمَنْ كَانَ مَرِيدًا أَوْ عَلَىٰ سَفَرٍ فَعِدَّةٌ مِنْ أَيَّامِ أُخْرَىٰ And whoever is ill or on a journey, then other days for the days missed in Ramadan. So he has allowed us, due to illness, to break the fast. So if the throwing up is a result, a result of an oncoming illness, then that person may have to uh, break the fast anyways, or it may just be uh, you know, something that you ate for suhoor, uh, that, it, that has created some uh, unsettling in your stomach and you throw up afterwards, you feel okay. So uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of us. I know there are many other issues uh, and questions that you might have and so on, uh, but hopefully as Ramadan progresses, we can discuss some, if not all, of these issues uh, uh, and matters. Uh, also, you know, perhaps during the khutbahs and so on in the month of Ramadan, you will hear a lot more about Siyam and its rules and regulations and objectives and so on. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of us. May He open up our hearts and minds so that we can understand this message that He has revealed for mankind. And may He inspire us all to live by this message. May Allah the Exalted make, make fasting easy for us. Uh, in a manner in which, in a manner that is pleasing to him, and may he accept our siyam, our salah, our dua, our qiyam, 
and all our good deeds and may he help us to avoid things that are sinful and useless while we fast in this month and may he help us to benefit from the many virtues and blessings he has chosen the month of Ramadan for أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته